great. I see many familiar names. Welcome. All right, I see Anne, Sue, Patrick, Fred, Yusuf, Alisa, Carissa, John, Melissa, Diane, Mark, Mark Arsland, Stacy, Susan, Chris, Matt, Wafia. And I see one new message, Christy from Evergreen. Right, is there anyone that I'm missing or is there anyone who missed a chance to write their name in the chat box? Oh, great, I see Kelly from Vancouver. Great. All right, welcome all again. Um, and Jen, great. Jen from PLU. All right, once again, welcome all. And now uh, I think we can begin our presentation session. Uh, we'd like to first start with the agenda part. Next slide, please. So we just started our meeting with the opening and welcoming. Um, then the first part of today's meeting uh, is devoted to the updates from Scale and Pearson. As you know, we've gone through many transition and changes this year. The major transition that we are experiencing now is the transition from Washington handbooks to the national handbooks. Kendall will share more information about this transition uh, along with the information around library specialist handbook update. And uh, also given the COVID spread, um, the, now, candidates are in totally new environment, which is the virtual learning environment. And there are uh, important updates and important guidance for completing a TPA in a virtual learning environment. And Kelly from Pearson will share uh, important information about these updates. And then we'll have a break and we'll come back around 10.30 and have a discussion around the implementation of the multiple measures pilot, which is also a new program this year. So today will be uh, packed with really great information and great opportunities to share your practices with others. Um, so around 10.50, we will wrap it up and, oh, not 10.50, sorry, it's 11.50. Uh, sorry for the typo on the agenda, and we will close at 12. So we have th three hour meeting. Next slide, please. All right, so now I'd like to turn it to Kendall. Okay, I'm going to um, just briefly go over the transition to the Washington handbook, uh, to the national handbooks. And the, and the library specialist, but the bulk of the updates are going to be um, done by Kelly about the guidance um, for any updates on that for completing um, a TPA in a virtual learning environment. Okay, next slide. And the next slide. <laughs> okay, um, as you know, we're, we're, we have, we're phasing out the Washington handbooks and Washington faculty and candidates are going to be using the national handbooks. The good news is the only difference between the two handbooks is a deletion of the special or the student voice prompts and rubrics. And so um, candidates who have previously registered prior to this scoring window for EdTPA, um, they can complete and submit their portfolio in the Washington version throughout the 2020-2021 program year. And ETPA registrations are valid for 18 months. So as long as they register within the last 18 months, they'll be fine. And next. 
Okay, candidates who are registering this program year need to know the Washington versions of the ET handbooks are no longer available for um, full for three task registrations. So that's that's true for both initial um, registrations and retakes. And so um, candidates who are, are want to do a three task retake will need to change their registration from the Washington handbook to the um, the national handbook. The Washington versions of the EdTP handbooks will be available for single and double task registrations for two program years um, from now until August 31st, 2022. Okay, um, they need to register for the retake handbook that matches their initial submission. So if they um, are using the Washington version, then the student um, voice portions since they're, they're no, they, well, they never did count, um, will not be scored and will therefore be left blank. Okay, are there any questions on that? They can still use up the amount of pages that they have, right? Because the Washington State, the page limits are a little bit larger, but they can yes. use Thank you. No, they need to, um, if they're, they're doing the National Handbook, they need to um, follow the guidance in the National Handbook. If they're using the Washington Handbook, yes, they could. Thank you. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, I also want to announce about the, there's a new handbook for um, library specialists. It's been retitled School Librarian Library Specialist. Uh, it was developed uh, in reaction to the the National Library, the AASL National Library Association um, changed their standards. They adopted new ones in 1918. And so the new um, handbook is aligned with those standards. There, a review copy of the handbook has been available in the resource library since last fall. Um, I'm not, not sure the word got out completely, but we've, we announced that. And so now we're uh, candidates who are, are want um, to take a TPA for a library credential or initial library credential need to use this new handbook. We're no longer accepting any submissions on the old handbook. Any questions about that? Okay, um, the 18th month policy about the registration, validity of the registrations uh, is 18 months from when they initially registered. And so, um, if they, but if they need to re-register because the, their registration has expired, um, they, they should contact Pearson. Okay, next slide. Okay, and all, all the candidates who were registered for the library, spent the old handbook, who had not yes passed were sent a message that they need to submit on the new library templates. And so they should um, be cognizant of that. And anyone who, um, the, the registrations for the old handbook were transferred to the new handbook for those people who were registered but had not yet passed. That's it for library. Kelly? Yep. Um, so folks, before we go into the completing a TPA in a virtual learning environment, I just want to pause to make sure there are no other questions for Kendall. Okay. Well, um, so as I mentioned, um, our team has been providing um, a series of national webinars on completing a TPA in a virtual learning environment. Um, and so many of you have been able Sorry, to- Sorry, Kelly. Oh, mm -hmm. please go. Ahead. It looks sorry about sorry to interrupt, but it looks like there is a question in the chat box. Uh, that uh, may I ask when the eighteen months policy ends? Oh yes, I'm sorry. I thought um, Kendall addressed that. So eighteen months is just when from the date that they register. Their registration is good for 18 months and candidates can always see that by going under their profile in edtpa.com. They'll see their registration date and their expiration date. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Yep, absolutely. Um, so as I was mentioning, we've been doing a series of national webinars. Hopefully you've been able to join us for one of those. Um, I'm gonna be covering the technical information that we cover during those webinars. Um, I do just want to put a little plug in for those webinars, though, because um, the first portion of it is what I'm going to cover with you today, but then we have a colleague 
joining us from UNC Charlotte, um, and he is actually sharing some examples of his candidates' work from the spring and summer um, who have successfully submitted in a, in a with evidence from a VLE. So if you're looking for, you know, some examples and some kind of anecdotal how-tos, then um, it'd be a great session for you to join. So, um, of course, <laughs> excuse me, you will have access to this slide deck. Please, at any time, don't hesitate to ask questions. I'll try to keep my eye um, on the chat. And Jisoo, also, please invite you to, to interrupt me if you see something that we need to address um, before we move on. But we wanted to start this off with just reminding you really of, you know, number one, the technical requirements of EdTPA and, you know, how we, we approached this new guidance, um, organizing the new scenarios that candidates fall themselves in, find themselves into, and really, you know, using the, the, their ability to interact with their students both asynchronously and synchronously in these new virtual learning environments. Um, that, that aspect of you know, having either asynchronous interaction when they're not able to work uh, in live time with their students versus synchronous interaction where they're able, you know, to interact, to have discussions, whether they be verbally or through chat or they're working together on a document, uh, collaborating together on a document, that, you know, really that, that requirement, that synchronous requirement for scorers to score, um, you know, the, the learning environment, the rapport that's going on, the engagement that, that um, teachers are, how they're engaging their students through the instruction, how are they deepening their understanding through questioning. All of those things require evidence of synchronous instruction. Um, so again, just kind of want to lay that, lay that down first as our foundation as we then move through this guidance. So we have updated the submission pro process from last spring. And I just wanted to show you some uh, quick screenshots here. If you go to edtpa.com, you can either click on candidates and find this information, or I find myself just clicking right here on this yellow banner that's in the center of the page and it will take you directly there. And you get to the page with requirements and considerations for candidates completing in a VLE. You'll notice several new documents. Um, I'm going to review with you in a few moments this updated guidance for EdTPA in a virtual learning environment. But I also want to point out a new updated FAQ document. Um, you can click on this. It will take you to all of the FAQs. And we are updating this, I mean, not on a weekly basis, but at least a bi-weekly, you know, every couple weeks where we have new questions, new clarifications that need to be made for the field. So if you haven't looked at that FAQ document in, in several weeks, we did just update it last week with some questions, <clears throat> or excuse me, folks were looking for some clarification around having both asynchronous and synchronous activities in their learning segment. <coughs> excuse me, so sorry. So check out those two documents if you have, you don't have those on hand. You also find on this page this graphic, and I know this is hard to see on your on your deck right at the moment, so I'm going to blow this up for you, and we're actually going to break down each of these parts. I did, however, want to just point out to you on this site, again, right underneath this graphic, you're going to have several PDF documents that will be helpful to you below. You can see they're hyperlinked there, the EdTPA submission requirements, as well as the request to alternative to video evidence. Now, we're going to walk through that process and who exactly needs to request alternative video evidence in just a few moments. This is a little bit larger picture of this graphic. Again, I'm going to take a moment here and just break down the green, the yellow, and the red. But as we were preparing this and really thinking about all of the different scenarios we're seeing currently, out in the field. Um, we color coded this with purpose, um, meaning that your candidates who fall into number one scenario, you can see that that's green because they do not need to do anything outside of registering as usual, usual and submitting their evidence. There is no longer a request form that they need to submit as they did in the spring. We have added and we're going to be adding some registration questions <clears throat> in order to, to be able to properly flag those portfolios. You also have some candidates who fall here in the yellow. And we like to say, you know, yellow, caution, you need to just slow down, make sure you read the guidelines and make sure that what you're able to collect will be um, successful, you know, will lead you to successful submission with EdTPA. So this is where we're gonna spend some time today for candidates who cannot collect video evidence, but who have some alternate forms of evidence options. And then lastly over here, candidates who fall into the red. And again, remember that because EdTPA 
EPA is requiring that synchronous activity, this would include candidates who do not have access to synchronous time with their students. So let's dive into each of these just a little bit more deeply. And so the green scenario, as I mentioned just a moment ago, green scenario is green is go. They don't have to stop. They don't have to do anything. They'll just register and submit as, as they had before. Um, in this scenario, the candidate's able to both deliver and collect task two video evidence, a synchronous instruction. So it's going to meet all of the technical requirements of the handbook and the submission guidelines. I do want to say here that the teacher and the students must be seen and heard However, what we call, you know, what we've always referred to as seen has changed a little and there is a little more flexibility. We understand that many districts may be saying to candidates, you cannot ask a student to turn on their video camera or you cannot video record into a student's home learning environment. If that's the case, they can replace that student with a nickname, with you know an emoji or an avatar or a picture. It does not have to be live video feed of that student, as long as they can still be you know seen right and heard interacting either verbally or through the chat box. That they would be counted towards that minimum number of students. So again, they don't have to see the live feed. The student can be represented by another visual. Um, as long as they're interacting with the teacher. And so in this case, they do not, again, do not need to submit any requirement or request for alternative arrangements because they're able to provide the video clips that are required. What they will be doing is, of course, reviewing the guidance, making sure they understand all of the guidance that has been provided. And during the EdTPA registration, they're going to have a new question that is about their learning environment. And the question is worded, Something like this, in which setting did you collect your task to video evidence? <coughs> I'm so sorry. Fall pollen here in West Virginia. Um, you have uh, either fully virtual, you have a fully face to face, or you have a blending of the two. And so candidates will be asked to <clears throat> provide that information so that we can properly tag that portfolio for data purposes. Just a few quick dates here. I don't want to spend a lot of time because this is tomorrow, actually. Um, tomorrow, these new registration questions will be live. If you had candidates to register before tomorrow, it's okay. <clears throat> if they have not yet submitted, before they submit, they will be redirected back to that registration question and asked to respond to that. Um, if they have already submitted and you're thinking, wait a minute, they didn't see a registration question, that's okay. We have a mechanism in place on the background that we're running where we're opening up and reviewing each of these portfolios prior to October 9th to properly tag them. Why do they need to be tagged? Number one, for data purposes, right? We, of course, want to continue and SCALE is going to continue mm -hmm. to monitor the performance of portfolios, you know, from traditional classrooms versus classrooms that have some sort of virtual learning environment component. We're looking at that data very closely now. We have over 600 submissions and are excited to see how many we have come in for this fall. Um, the other purpose is that we are continuing double scoring on these portfolios, at least through the end of this year by request of scale. So um, again, we want to make sure that we have them properly flagged so that they can <clears throat> get both of these assurances and the, the data points as well. Kelly, uh, yes. there's a question in the chat. Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, it goes back to the green. Um, it says, Kelly, in terms of this part, and, and I suspect it means the part about seeing students as emojis, et cetera. I understand it will not apply to the PE context, right? Right, yeah, and Kendall, please feel free to add in on here. So I know you, you folks are very familiar with the physical education handbook and its requirements. So physical education, and yes, thank you for pointing that out. Physical education is a little different animal in that it does require evidence. This, the, the teacher, the student teacher, has to be able to see the students and assess their psychomotor activity. Um, so yes, in PE, now while they might be able to like blur the student's face or cover up the student's face within a video, they are going to still need to have video access to their students so that they can see their body and so that they can assess those psychomotor skills. Kendall, is there anything you would like to add there? <clears throat> Um, yes, I think you can, and if candidates are doing a task which, in, which involves them physically seeing what the students are doing, 
that's going to be very difficult to score um, when you can't see what the students are doing. So they should um, think twice about, they should think very carefully about the, ta the learning tasks that they select um, for the video. And that's just a caution. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so Carrie, you're asking if the camera is on the teacher exclusively with audio of students live learning, is that acceptable? So Carrie, I mean, we, we still need to see, you know, that there are the minimum number for students involved. So if that means that, you know, the teacher could just put on a gallery view for a moment or do a roll call at the beginning, but just something that the score can see, one, two, three, four, yes, there are four students here. Um, if their name can pop up when they're speaking. Um, we've had some teachers who, you know, are either recording within the learning environment itself, or they may have a, uh, like holding their phone or holding a camera, you know, out to the side where they're able to capture both themselves working in the VLE and then the students. Um, but the students do have to be represented visually in some way. If they're interacting in the chat that, that's captured in that video, you know, that would count to be able to see the individual students. But the score just has to be able to some way determine and confirm that there are at least four students involved. Okay. Um, so we'll go back. We'll come back to the PE in just a moment if that's okay. I don't want to get too hung up on this. Now, um, but we will certainly talk about it. Uh, we can pull up that, that PE specific guidance. Um, Jan, thank you for the clarification. No, you are correct. With special education, um, the candidate could just be working with one focus learner. Um, and, and that is the minimum that they have for special education. It, special education is the exception to the, that minimum of four students. So yes, a teacher and a flash of four emojis would be acceptable. Again, just, just long enough for this, the, the score to, to verify and to feel comfortable to say, yes, this is a teacher working with you know, four learners. That's, that's really the visual that they needed. It could just be for, for a moment's notice. Okay, all right. So let's talk a little bit about candidates who are not able to video record. Okay, so we've had a lot of districts who say, okay, we're going to give you Zoom or we're going to give you, you know, Google Meets or something that does allow for synchronous, but under no circumstances are you to videotape in that environment. Um, so in that case, uh, we are providing scenario two, and this does require um, candidates to re submit a request for alternative forms of evidence. So with this process, candidates are able to collect evidence in two alternative formats, those being either an audio recording of the, the synchronous um, interaction or a written transcript of that synchronous interaction. Now for this, we do ask that the candidates um, work with you, of course, first, because sometimes we've, we've found candidates have submitted this request sometimes when they, they don't really need to, um, because they haven't you know, dug through the guidance enough and they may not realize that, oh, if I just need to cover the faces of my students, that's fine, that still keeps me in green. So please work with your, your candidates. This is a two-step verif ver ver verification process so that we can confirm that they've at least talked with someone about this and have been advised on their next steps. Um, I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes what this format looks like, but we do ask that you fill out a format first. And then once we do that, we reach out to the candidate and take it from there. I'm going to dive into that here in just another moment. So for, if you're thinking you have candidates who fall into that yellow scenario, just hold on for one moment and we'll, we'll move back to that. And I did just want to quickly cover scenario three. So again, this may be your candidate. They're working with a district who has only asynchronous instruction. In this case, as I mentioned before, this evidence is not going to meet that technical requirement specified in the handbooks, um, as it does require evidence of synchronous instruction. And so in this case, we would of course ask that the pro this the the candidate work with you um, and or their state agency to determine, you know, what, what guidance they need on meeting state licensure requirements. 
Um, we know here in the state of Washington that you do have an option for candidates who are not able to complete EdTPA at this time. That gives them a little more time to work on that. Um, so again, we advise candidates who aren't able to collect synchronous evidence to work with you in the state to make sure they best they understand their next steps and, and what they will need to co um, complete to meet those certification requirements. Okay, so I see just a few questions. Let me just skim these really quickly. Yes, Leanne. So to answer your question, you know, she's asking again, they just have to be able to verify that there's four. Um, and so if they want to do a quick roll call, even if it's not with the entire class, then yes, they could certainly do that. Okay. Kelly, couldn't they also um, just have them like we did um, at the beginning, um, just log into the chat and, and say, I'm here? Yes. And that yeah. would be evidence yeah. too. And that would take even less time. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's a great example of, of what GSU did this morning. Absolutely. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more then about, again, the scenario two. So for candidates who cannot collect video evidence, we're going to ask that you as the EPP first fill out a form. I'm going to show you where that is. This is a screenshot from the website, and I have hyperlinks in here for you as well, so it will take you directly there. But it's on that page requesting an alternative to video evidence. If you look right down here at the bottom, and I'm going to blow this up for you just a little bit larger. So you can see that with this information, you're going to have the EPP verification form right here. It's an Excel spreadsheet that you'll just download and complete. And then you're going to submit that email to my team at EdTPA EPP support at Pearson. Here's just a screenshot of what this form looks like. Very simple Excel format. Notice it has two tabs. The first tab is your information from the EPP, you know, who the primary contact is in case we have any questions. The second page is for you to complete with your candidates information first name last name verify that they need this uh, th they need these alternative arrangements and their email address <clears throat> once you have submitted this to us we take it from there we will reach out to your candidates and ask them to complete some uh, private information, personal information, so that we can confirm that we have the right person selected um, and then from that point on you will receive notification of approval along with your candidate with some extensive instructions on how they use audio or scripting um, in lieu of the video. And those instructions are available on the website for you as well. So if you're thinking, well, I've never transcribed a lesson before, what does that look like? Um, we have some pretty specific instructions for you, and so I'd encourage you to read over that. Um, although we're right now we're able to turn these around very quickly, we just ask that to give everyone plenty of time um, that you start this process two weeks prior to them submitting so that we can get everything in place and get that portfolio properly flagged. Now, folks, you know, I mentioned to you before that it's important for us to identify all portfolios that have VLE evidence, but it's extremely important that we, that we flag these portfolios that are not going to have video evidence. Um, I know you've been at this game long enough that you know that if a candidate submits unscorable evidence, then they're going to get a condition code. And so we want to make sure that we get these portfolios flagged, that when they come in, we can tell scoring, you know, hey, this is not going to have video evidence um, and we push that down a certain pathway a certain route and scoring so that it doesn't have condition codes issued to it so again just you know please um, encourage your candidates and and you know impress upon them if you can how important it is that they get that paperwork in um, plenty ahead of time Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the guidance. And again, there's a lot of text here, folks, and I, I apologize for that. I know that's not the best way to, to present information, but I wanted you to have this. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase this for you a bit. Um, this is the guidance document. It's in a PDF, and I basically just took screenshots of it. So this is the exact document. Um, you know, again, if you haven't had a chance to, to join us on one of our national webinars, please try to, as our colleague Tom, <clears throat> he's able to give a lot of great great examples for each of these bits of guidance. So let's talk just a little bit about task one. Basically, you know, task one is it really truly affected um, as far as their preparing of materials for EdTPA, right? There's no synchronous requirement, but we do want to mention here that, you know, we know that things are changing 
every, if not every week, every day in the classroom. And they may have planned to have been face to face and now they find themselves teaching virtually next week. If that happens, they do not need to go back and rewrite task one. You know, if they're still able to teach that same learning segment to the same group or basically the same group of students that they plan for, they don't need to go back and redo everything, but they do just need to make note of it in the front and the first piece of their task two or their task three commentary, whichever is affected. But believe me, we've, you know, scoring has had a lot of conversations and our scores are teachers, remember that. So they know what's going on, they understand how everything is so fluid and things can just change at the, at the drop of a hat. In task two, as always, we wanna ensure that they have those appropriate permission forms in place. And folks, you know, Pearson has not updated the sample permission form that we have. Um, we just, you know, encourage you as always, whether it's brick and mortar or virtual, that you have permission from both the children and the adults who may be, you know, captured in the video. We know now, especially with some of these, the, the younger kiddos, you know, their mom or dad or, uh, you know, a, a teacher or tutor may be working with them. And so just ensure candidates have permissions for anyone that is captured in the video. Um, they want to just familiarize themselves you know, just like the tools in your brick and mortar classroom. Um, you know, there are a lot of tools within these learning management systems that they can um, determine how best to capture their evidence. You know, if they're using Zoom, they may record directly within Zoom, but they need to know that, hey, when I do that, you know, my chat doesn't record in that window, right? It downloads as a separate text file. Um, they may find a third party screen recorder where it will record everything they're doing on the screen. Or they may have, as I mentioned, Tom shows a great example where he has a candidate with a little tripod and her phone sitting right beside her. Actually, I think it's an uh, iPad, but she's recording herself teaching her students virtually, you know, from kind of a third person view. All of those work, right? And it could, they could even have a mix of those. Um, and so they just need to think outside of the box, get familiar with their tools and make sure that they are, again, setting up opportunities for the students to engage with them, to ask questions, to be both seen and heard. Um, and so if they're using different collage views or speaker views, they just need to practice with that stuff before they go to record for EdTPA. You know, as always, again, same in the brick and mortar. Try to plan for more than four students if at all possible. You never know when, you know, you're gonna have technology issues or someone that's not going to be able to join you that day. Just a note here again that yes, students still need to be seen and heard, but they can be represented by, you know, their name or uh, a picture or emoji that it does not have to be their live video feed. Practice, 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 you know, not just with the tools, um, but also the different um, or the, the learning tools within the platform. You know, you don't want to spring using a whiteboard for the first time when you're trying to record for EdTPA. You know, get used to it. Get the kids used to it. Have them collaborate on a Google Doc or something before beforehand to practice using those different tools you may be using. And as always, you know, there are a lot of free softwares out there to blur. If you just seriously Google, blur faces in video, you'll get, you know, I mean, lists of free and, and easy to use softwares that, that students can use. Um, how they're going to trim, you know, Handbrake is still one that we hear programs using a lot. And so, you know, these, this, again, a lot of this guidance is, is just as true for face-to-face -face as it is virtual. But they need to think about, again, just other ways they can show engagement. It doesn't have to be their video. It can be them collaborating in a document on a discussion board on a chat and if they're able to download anything like that like I mentioned a few moments ago you know if you download a recording of zoom your chat downloads in a different file it's not in the recording so if that happens they can just add that that dialogue to the end of their task to commentary so when I'm talking about evidence in my commentary, I may say, you know, in my video clip at video clip one at two minutes and 32 seconds, you see blah, 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 blah. You can also see in my chat, you know, they'll just need to reference the score there so that the score knows there's multiple, there are multiple, multiple pieces of evidence at play. But again, they, they can add that to the end of their commentary and there are no, um, there are no uh, time limits. So where would it be appropriate for them to discuss changes for a virtual learning environment? Leanne, that's a great question. I, we're recommending people do it in the very first prompt. And, and so again, if things have changed and you maybe had planned to do this, you know, face-to-face -face and now you're virtual, 
first sentence of their prompt task to prompt commentary. They just make one sentence statement that things have changed. Same thing in task three, but I would put it right up there in front of the scored is it's the first thing that they see so that they're, uh, they understand that maybe what they anticipated to see from the planning is not exactly what they're going to see in the task two evidence. Okay. A um, few other things about task three, you know, task three really, um, again, for physical education, we can talk about that a little bit, but for task three, um, as before, candidates are able to collect this evidence either in synchronous or asynchronous formats, right? Um, certainly, if they want to give the live feedback, they could do that by, via audio, visual, or I'm sorry, audio file or video file as before, but just as before, they have lots of flexibility around the type of feedback, the way that they're collecting and delivering their assessments. Um, so they just want to familiarize with those different formats and, and tools that they have within their system um, to make sure that they're giving themselves plenty of opportunity to provide that rich feedback and then talk about how students can use that feedback. Um, in task, we actually I took out task four because we don't we, we don't use task four in Washington. So I think that is it for the guidance. Um, again, if they're able to collect anything that is not in that the actual video clip, they could just add it onto their task three commentary. So any chats, any discussion boards, any emails where they're providing feedback, um, they could certainly just um, provide that um, in addition. Actually, I had a question the other day about if I'm able to collect video evidence of my feedback, but then I'm also given give, giving written evidence, you know, can I do both? And you know, in the evidence chart in the back, I mean, it, the platform will only allow you to upload one form of evidence, right, for feedback. So I would go with the video if you have it. And then again, you could certainly, um, you know, write, write to that video evidence, but also provide that any written, anything you do in addition to that, to the end of that commentary. Okay. Alrighty, so as I mentioned before, there is that subject specific guidance at the end of this document. So we have some subject, subject specific guidance for those of you using early childhood or elementary handbooks, um, agriculture and science education, performing arts, physical education, special education, and virtual arts. Um, and yes, you know, physical education, we continue to look at portfolios as they come in, um, but our our physical education, you know, designers and scorers have just continued to go back to because the way that the handbook um, is designed and the type of evidence that what it's measuring and, and what it is requiring is that it does require they have video evidence of their students performing um, in that physical education handbook. I know there was a question earlier, I think, about the blurring. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think it's it's kind of on a case by case basis as to whether or not they can they can blur all the faces. Then I'll, I'll certainly go back and get clarification for that or confirmation. Um, but if they can blur a face without you know totally blocking what needs to be measured, right? I mean, what are what are they? I guess it would depend on the por the performance objective and what they're what they're trying to measure with their students. But if I've always been told by scoring, if the blurring doesn't obstruct what this the teacher and the score needs to see, then the blurring isn't an issue. And Kendall, I don't and I apologize. I don't know if maybe you've had other conversations with physical education. If you could confirm that one way or the other. No, there's, there, it wouldn't affect the scoring. They're scoring them on, um, you know, how the teacher's interacting with the students around the physical psychomotor movement, that's it, psychomotor skill. And so as long as the blurring doesn't interfere with being able to see whatever the psychomotor skill is, so if the face, they, there's no, I don't think there's anything, I could be wrong, but I don't think there's anything at PE which involves just facial expression. Okay, um, but I will certainly get that confirmed, um, Tenjin. I see that question, and so I'll check with Pam, uh, you know, our team internally, and just make sure I'm not missing something. Um, There's a question about the special ed handbook about force. Does it require four students? 
Okay, yes, no, yes. With the special education, they do just need to have the one focused learner. And Maxine, I see your question as well. Um, some candidates are concerned because not all students are engaged. Can you confirm that candidates will not be penalized if they're planning for class of 20, but only eight students are engaged and there's student work from only five? Um, yes, so I think, you know, that that's really what I was trying to, to say there, and I'm happy to confirm it, that yes, if they've planned for 20, only eight show up and are engaged for the video and then they're only able to assess five of the 20 um they will not be penalized they just need to mention it right they need to just tell the score like i only had eight students you know in this virtual lesson today that's all they need to say or i was only able to assess five of the 20. Um, but just a very brief explanation just so the score knows that they weren't just leaving them out you know for other reasons right that that it was because of the access Absolutely. So I wanted to just show you a few other things really quickly and then happen to happy to open this up to more questions. Um, we did just release some new webinars um, and I've been so happy to have um, so many folks from Washington to join us. We are trying to offer these at varying times throughout the days and evenings um, so that you know our, our friends on the West Coast can join us. And so we've just released, um, if you go to edtpa.com and click on the faculty button right at the top, you will see all all of the new webinar series that we've released. So um, we have are going to be continuing the NCPA 101s and deep dive webinars in January and February. So these are perfect if you have new faculty, new supervisors, new P12 partners who are coming on board who just kind of need, you know, everything from the 10 foot view it, to the deeper dives into those tasks. Please share that information with them. Um, based on our 101s and, and deep dives from this fall, we had a lot of requests for academic language. So we have added four academic language webinars starting next month in November. And I believe we have one scheduled November, December, January, and February. Um, we also have a series coming up in the evenings for mentor and cooperating teachers. So again, a happy, um, encourage you to share that out with your P12 partners. And then also um, the sessions that I mentioned to you before completing EdTPA in a virtual learning environment. Now, these are all four programs. I see the question about these being recorded. Unfortunately, as of right now, we are not able to record these because we do share assessment material and proprietary information in those recordings. However, um, we are trying to offer them multiple times. Um, so I hope you're able to, you know, get there and see that there are, you know, multiple opportunities for you to join and we'll keep fighting the fight to try to get some recordings available um, and, and we'll let you know if we're able to do that. I also just wanted to mention that we do have some webinar series for candidates as well. Um, and these are found um, on the, actually, I'll, I'll just make sure this is hyperlinked for you, but also on edtpa.com, they're just under candidates. Um, but you can see here that we have some series coming up. Um, this one is for October, it actually starts next week, but we also have some series coming up specifically for retakes. So the series, first of all, that we're doing over here on the left, this is offered every month. And so um, this month, it's, you can see it's next week, the 12th through the 15th. It's every evening, twice an evening. So um, the first night, Monday, we'll just be doing a getting started. It will cover kind of the registration and policies that will run at either 3 p.m. or 6 p.m. for you. Um, the second night it is, is a walkthrough of the handbook. The third night is a walkthrough of several supplemental resources. And the fourth night is about completing EdTP in a virtual learning environment. So again, please share this with your candidates that you work with either now or may have worked with last semester and who are trying now to complete EdTPA um, during this academic year. Okay. I, uh, oh, let me put this up real quick and then I think we have a little break, but just wanted to, again, um, I think most of you have my email address. This is my team's email address. Um, we welcome you to send any questions our way and, um, you know, we'll continue to just to provide as much support as we can as we all work through this together. But I'm happy to take uh, any other questions. And I do see a question here to Maxine's follow up. Um, so the question is, you know, does the teacher candidate need to describe, I think maybe the changes in talk, um, I'm sorry, in context for learning. Um, 
you know, they, they don't necessarily have to. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of under the, the thought of, you know, yes, anywhere they can, they provide an explanation of their situation and the fluidity of their situation. It doesn't hurt. I wouldn't spend a lot of time in it in the context for learning, you know, when they have an opportunity to talk about their school or their schedule. I mean, they may want to say something like, you know, I meet with, uh, face-to-face students, you know, A and B day or whatever. I mean, uh, but, but not get into real detail. They'll, they'll be able to explain, again, any discrepancies amongst, you know, between their planning and their teaching or their assessing in the commentary. Really, they should be using that context for just kind of overall, you know, sharing um, what the situation that they're in. But, but they, I mean, they could mention the, the flexibility or the, the fluctuation in student numbers, but they don't need to dwell on it. Um, and then just one last question, I think, maybe about the um, the webinars. Um, yeah, folks, you know, the, the ones that we have for faculty, they do say they're intended for faculty. I know it's a lot of text, though. It's easy to look over. <laughs> but um, on the, I'm just going to pause this. Just one one uh, minute. Let me just show the website real quick, if you don't mind, before we finish up. So on etpa.com. If you're looking for webinars that are appropriate for you or for your faculty, uh, just start right here, you know, click on this faculty button. I'm sorry, my internet is incredibly slow all of a sudden. Um, but that's where you will see the webinars for the can, I mean, I'm sorry, for the faculty listed. They're just right here at the top of the page. If you go under candidates and getting started, but I will put this hyperlink here for you. It's just that it's kind of buried here, actually. We're trying to get a pop-up so that it's a little more noticeable, but it's right here for candidates. It says, I know we don't have unaffiliated candidates in Washington, but nationally we refer to them more as unaffiliated candidates. So all of their information is right here and the webinar information is here as well. So I'll make sure I include that in the slide deck as hyperlinks. Okay. Um, all righty, I see another question here. Let's see. In the VLE guidance document for the purpose of VLE task three student clips, it's understood that the student may be presented in isolation. Um, can you please clarify because this isolation may violate some education purpose? Um, yeah, Kendall. I think that probably was a reaction to PE, which always wanted to see the student, the, the, a video clip of student performance in the context of the whole class. Right. Um, th this doesn't mean they have to show them in isolation, but, but that relax, that was really different. You know, when students are at home, they aren't in the context of any class. So that was really intended to provide more flexibility for PE. Right. So, so I repeat, it's not required that they be in isolation. Right. Yes. Just saying that for once, for now, it is acceptable, right? That it wasn't before, but that now because they may be home learning that, yes, that it's acceptable. Okay. I hope that, um, right, you can't pull out students in the regular setting. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, folks? So I know things sometimes if you digest and then more questions come up. So I'm, I'm going to be here the rest of the meeting today. And so if there are other questions that come up, um, please don't hesitate to send them to me and, um, you know, happy, happy to, to either pull resources or, or ask if we don't have those on hands for you. So thank you all. Certainly appreciate the time you've given us today to provide these updates and um, look forward to spending the rest of the morning with you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Kelly and Kendall. It was very informative session. And uh, thank you for answering all the questions from the participants. Um, and thank you everyone uh, for your great questions and your engagement in the morning session as well. So now we are going to take a break for next 10 minutes and we'll come back at, so now it's 10.01, so let's come back at 10.11 and we'll dive into the multiple measures part. All right, let's come back at 10, 11. And we can stop recording. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>